Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, the X-Zone is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www.exxoneradiotv.com or www.exxonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember X-Zone Nation, keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. Kevin is a retired United States Army Lieutenant Colonel who has studied UFOs for more than 50 years. His military training has provided him with a unique insight into military operations and UFO research. Kevin has investigated many of the most mysterious cases and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries and been interviewed on hundreds of radio and television programs about UFOs. Considered to be one of the leading experts on the Roswell UFO crash, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs including Roswell in the 21st Century and Encounter in the Desert, a re-examination of the Socorro UFO landing. Now here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And good day. This is, in fact, A Different Perspective, and I'm Kevin Randall. I'll be joined by Jim Willis in just a minute. We're going to talk about lost civilizations and the secret histories and suppressed technologies of the ancients. Normally, I do a little bit of a rant at this point of the program, something that I like to do, but I have nothing that annoys me today that has to do with UFOs. There's a lot of things out there that annoy me, but this is not the proper forum to discuss those. So we'll skip the rant and just get into the program. Uh, Jim Willis, after graduating from the prestigious Eastman School of Music, was a high school band and orchestra teacher during the day, a symphony trombonist on the weekends, and a jazz musician musician at night. I want to say magician. Jazz musician at night and a choral coordinator conductor uh, on Sunday mornings before earning his master's degree in religion and entering the Protestant ministry for 40 years. I should say to Jim that sometimes a period helps. Uh, just a little editorial comment there for no reason whatsoever. He is the author of 12 books on religion and spirituality. He has served as the Ungjet Adjunct College Professor in the fields of world religions and instrumental music while working part-time as a carpenter. He's the host of his own, or was the host of his own Drive Time radio show, an arts council director, and a great lecturer speaking about topics ranging from historical studies to contemporary spirituality. His latest book is Lost Civilizations from Visible Ink Press. Uh, while living in his current re- residence in the woods of South Carolina, he wrote Ancient Gods, Lost Histories, Hidden Truths, and Conspiracy of Silence. That's one title, I suspect. And Supernatural Gods, Spiritual Mysteries, Psychic Experience, and Scientific Truths and that were published by uh, Visible Ink Press. And as I mentioned earlier, 
His current book is Lost Civilizations, The Secret Histories of Suppressed Technologies of the Ancients. Jim Willis, welcome to A Different Perspective. Thank you, Kevin. Good to be with you and good to talk to you because uh, this is the first time I've talked to a uh, Visible Ink Press colleague. We, we've we kept uh, Kevin and Roger pretty busy over the last 10 years, haven't we? Uh I've talked to a lot of them, uh, Brad Steiger and Jerry Clark, to name just few, two that I, I've dealt with. Uh, yes, and it's always good to talk to a fellow um, Visible Ink colleague. Well, uh, uh, being out here in the woods, I don't get the opportunity to talk to <laughs> folks like you do, but it's good, to, it's good to be with you today, that's for sure. Well, then let me ask you a snarky question. Snarky, snarky question. Snarky, yes. Um, I noticed in your book you mentioned that um, archaeologists don't uh, deal with myths and legends that much and kind of ignore those uh, for more traditional pathways to the truth. And I was wondering, do you have any professional or academic background in archaeology or uh, anthropology? Uh, some in anthropology, very little in archaeology. However, I've talked to an awful lot of archaeologists over the past um, I think that's changing. Um, I, I think the tendency, with, especially with the young archaeologists coming up, uh, in, in Lost Civilizations, I follow two lines of evidence. One is what I call uh, evidence in stone, which refers to the uh, artifacts and the megaliths and the stone structures that have, have stood the test of time and are still standing from Gobekli Tepe to Stonehenge to Egypt to the Mayan culture. But also the uh, evidence that I call evidence in story, and that refers to the mythology and the um, religious traditions, especially that go way back in time. In the past, uh, and I'm talking, you know, quite a few years ago, in the field of archaeology, there wasn't that much attention paid to the oral histories, to the mythologies. But lately, I think that's changing. Well, I was going to say, I was going to say, you know, my undergraduate work was done in anthropology with an emphasis on archaeology. And for, yeah, for yeah. all of the people go out there and check to see if this is true, I will say one thing that given the fact I was an ROTC and I needed to graduate at a specific time, I had to change majors in my last semester. But the majority of uh, my work was done in anthropology and uh, archaeology. Yeah. But I had noticed at that time that they were taking an interest in the myths and the legends. And uh, wasn't it Shulman who uh, yes. found Troy based yes. on the myths and the history? And that goes back into the 19th century. So I was a little surprised at that that comment, and I just thought I'd bring it up. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you did, because I, I am delighted that the uh, emphasis seems to be changing. I, I'm not exactly sure why, but I have a suspicion that part of it, at least, is due to the fact that up until relatively recently in history, and you and I are about the same age, so we've lived through this same time, uh, up until relatively recently, uh, if you wanted to get new ideas out into the open, you pretty well had to go through the academic community. And in the academic community, of course, whether it's uh, whatever field of academia you're, you're looking at, you have a, a group of people who uh, kind of get into it, get control of it, write the textbooks, deliver the lectures, and if you want to advance, you have to parrot back to them what they are teaching you. And so it was that way for an awful long time, but lately we have the Internet, we have the History Channel, we have the Discovery Channel, which allows people to kind of do an end run around the normal academic uh, pathways. Now, in some ways, this is bad because it means that you get out there without a lot of peer review. And there's, <laughs> I'm sure we're all well aware there's a lot of wacky, crazy theories on the Internet and even on television. But uh, it does allow people to have a voice, people to have a say. There's a, an archaeologist uh, who's a, a, a friend of mine who is doing uh, tremendous work with the university here in South Carolina down at a site down the Savannah River from us called the Topper Site. And uh, as I, I won't give you his name right now, although he is retired, but I haven't asked him if I could say it, so I won't give his name. But he's he's the leading uh, the leading voice behind the Topper Site, which has uh, found almost incontrovertible evidence that has been uh, verified again and again by multiple scientific establishments and universities. 
that has pushed uh, human occupation here along the Savannah River right in our backyard back to possibly as long as 50 to 55,000 years ago. Well, well I was think, wasn't 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 some of the stuff that he found there uh, related to the Clovis uh, yes, that and that's Clovis what, type of uh, materials, which at one point in New Mexico, it's named for Clovis, New Mexico, which yes, that's right. you would know, but my, the audience may not. <laughs> but but it's a, a specific type of spear point or arrowhead. And yes. he has found these things in South Carolina, which suggests a connection to France as opposed to something coming to. Yes. As a matter, matter of fact, as a matter of fact, it, it, it goes. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I just gonna it, it, instead of coming from Asia d- and down that it suggests something that was coming from France at a, uh, around the same time as a period. The Salutrian hypothesis, yeah, we we can get into that in a second. But wh- uh, what I was going to say is, when I talked to him, he was deliberately a a Clovis first guy. Now, Clovis first is the theory that held true for the last fifty years, maybe even a hundred years in American history, that said the first people here in America came uh, at the most around 16,000 years ago, and they came over the Siberian land bridge when the uh, ice levels were soaking up so much water that there was a land bridge that ran from Siberia to Alaska and right down into the central heart of the American Great Plains. And since their particular point that they used was called the Clovis Point, uh, and it was so, uh, it was probably the first great American invention. It's a beautiful, beautiful rock um, uh, point. But because it was found down near Clovis, New Mexico, um, these people were considered the first people here, and they were called the Clovis people. Well, <laughs> the man who we're talking about, who is here in South Carolina, was uh, a Clovis first guy himself all the time. But when he was digging at this Clovis site and finding all these Clovis points that go back 16,000, 20,000 years, he was moved by uh, some examples up in Pennsylvania and uh, other places in Peru and Oklahoma and Texas. He was moved to go a little bit deeper because these other places that he was studying uh, seemed to have very good and very uh, clear evidence that there were people here before the Clovis. So the Clovis first theory, which was holding sway in academia, and still is in many cases, began to look a little bit risky. So he decided to dig deeper. And he told the people he was working with, he said, if we go deeper, we are risking our reputations because we will undoubtedly be criticized from all over if we say there was anything more than Clovis first in America. And so they did go deeper and deeper and deeper. And right now, as I say, they found evidence of human occupations here, which predate Clovis by thousands of years. Uh, uh, instead of 16, 20,000 years, we're now talking 50 to 55,000 years. And then, well, of course, let, me, since- let me interrupt you here because I'm going to have to take a break. Okay. We're coming up on our first break. Uh, the book is Lost Civilizations, the Secret Histories and Suppressed Technologies of the Ancients. The website is www. Jim Willis, all one word, uh, all lowercase, jimwillis.net. Uh, so that you can take a look at some of his work. I'll have additional information up at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And I think when we come back, I might change the tone of the conversation a bit and, and, and talk to you a little bit about the ancient astronaut theory. Is this, mm-hmm. That's kind of the interest where we'd be going in this, in this program. So I will be back in just a moment with Jim Willis, so please stick around. It's hard to listen to the news without realizing we're living in volatile, unprecedented times. Yet never has there been such an opportunity to transform the human condition. As old structures fail, where can we find the guidance to co-create a better way? Find Your Path Home is an ever-evolving, leading-edge information, education, and healing resource center designed to support and guide you on your path to unity and enlightenment. Based on sound principles employed by Shaman Worldwide, we provide techniques that can support you through the current transitions. 
offering online shamanic classes, international long-distance shamanic healing sessions, complimentary Mission Evolution radio episodes and Stairway to Heaven TV vignettes, seminars, retreats, and much more. All of this can be found on findyourpathhome.com. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens, and they kept repeating to me over and over again, Simultv.com, Simultv.com. What's Simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a Simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. SIMULTV.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. SIMULTV.com. Shamanic healing is the key to personal empowerment. Why? All four levels of our being physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, must be addressed for us to enjoy balanced, healthy, abundant lives. Yet there are few provisions for spiritual or energetic healing. Shamanism, found at the root of all cultures, is a very effective spiritual healing modality. To find quality shamanic healing you can trust, regardless of where you live, look no further than find your Path Home Long Distance Shamanic Healing Program. All Path Home Long Distance Healing Practitioners have been trained and certified through Path Home Shamanic Art School. Change your life. Live abundantly. Schedule a long-distance shamanic healing session with Gwilda Wiecka or one of her quality practitioners today at findyourpathhome.com. I am joined by Jim Willis. As I've said, he's the author of Lost Civilizations, The Secret Histories and Suppressed Technologies of the Ancients. And when we went away, we were getting a little bit deep, I think, into the esoteric of um, of uh, archaeology, talking about the Clovis points. And I understand what you're talking about, because having studied archaeology, I was familiar with this. But I think we might lose some of the audience um, because of the, the technical nature of that. But I think it's su- sufficient to say that the um, history of the New World, as as we understood it, when we were in school and growing up, uh, has changed significantly, and the uh, occupation of the New World uh, goes back much, much further than than we thought, and there may be a connection to Europe, which I think are the important points. Mm-hmm. If, yes. uh, um, but we're talking about uh, lost civilizations, and I'm, I was wondering if you had a an opinion on the ancient astronauts theories that are prevalent on TV that you mentioned, uh, the History Channel and Discovery and all of that? For probably the first uh, 50 years of my life, maybe 55 years of my life, um, I was not a believer. Gradually, something began to change. I came across evidence that is ancient in origin and seems to be beyond... um, Anything that we have experienced here on Earth, again, I go back to the the uh, the stories, the oral histories, the texts that all seem to talk about the sky people, uh, the Indians of the Southwest, where my wife and I lived for a while while we were writing our book Armageddon Now, the end of the world A to Z, and we were talking to Hopi leaders and Zuni leaders. And um, they all talked about the Pleiades, and uh, they've traced their ancestry from the skies. When we were living up in New England, we come across the red paint people who um, believed that their ancestors came from the skies. And I began to look at the texts of the Old Testament, uh, what we, the Jewish scriptures, which, which Christian, in Christianity we call the Old Testament, the texts that are there, that are accepted, that are in everybody's Bible, Who, whoever's got a Bible at home listening to this, you can look up these texts and discover references to other texts and other people that are not described. People like Enoch, for instance, uh, and uh, the Nephilim, the sons of God who came down to earth to mate with the daughters of men. And they all seem to reference these texts 
in our lifetime, in the, in the Dead Sea and in Egypt, uh, in, in Central America, in other places around the world, we're coming in Anatolia, we're coming across these texts that all seem to uh, point a solid uh, oral history that points us to the skies, that said we are not um, necessarily the first here on Earth, that perhaps something has happened. Our, our, our genes have been manipulated. Uh, we have had actual um, intercourse in the past. This is right from the Bible now in Genesis. Uh, intercourse with the past about people who are, uh, only, can only be described as angelic beings. And when we put them together, uh, it just seems to be some solid evidence to me that said our ancestors really believe we came from the skies. And the more I look and the more I discover uh, places like uh, Gobekli Tepe, we could get into that, um, uh, Egypt, of course, and in, in the Mayan tradition and the Southwest tradition, and even here in South America, South, South Carolina, where we live, right on our property where we live, there are all of these signs that seem to point to the fact that we came or were manufactured, so to speak, by someone else. So in the last 15 years of my life, I found myself much to my surprise. Um, but you're talking, you're talking about stories here. You're talking about yeah. oral traditions. You're not talking well, about any physical evidence. Well, I'm, I'm talking about mostly, mostly the, uh, the, the stories, but there's physical evidence. And of course, you would know a lot about more because more, you've written about more than this than I have. But the physical evidence seems to be here, those mysterious um, anomalous inventions or the, the technologies that seem to have been there that could only have come from somewhere else. A uh, classic example, when I, was, when I was over in Egypt, my first trip down into the pyramids, we're walking down as all the tourists were down, the, down into the pyramids, and I'm seeing these big electric cables going along the pathway on both sides, and they were to light up all the, they were to, to feed electricity to all the lights that were making it possible for us to see. And so I began to wonder, how did the people get down in here? What was their light source? And so uh, I asked the guide. I, I, I looked up at the ceiling. There was no soot. There was no evidence of smoke or anything from torches or anything like that. And I said to the guide, who was uh, up until now had been very forthcoming, I, I said, how did they get down here without electricity? I, I don't see any evidence of torches. And he literally looked down at his feet, looked back at me, walked away as he said to me, well, they must have had some kind of light source. <laughs> what kind of light source? Where could it have come from? He didn't know, and he wasn't even going to talk about it. I couldn't find an Egypt e Egyptologist over there who would talk about it. He said, well, obviously they did it, and that's as far as they can get. So but, I, have yeah, but to... I think the, the problem I have with this is, is that we're, we're talking about an advanced civilization, I guess, influencing our... Uh, evolutions are uh, building towards civilization. Why is it when they got to Earth, the only building material they could find was stone? No That's... evidence of steel or or that kind of construction, which or metal, good metallurgy, which you would expect a spacefaring race to have. That's a great question, and I have no, I have no answer for it. The only the the best I can come up with was that they had a different kind of toolkit. We tend to say that past civilizations, if they were advanced civilizations, must have looked like us. They must have used generators. They must have used wires. They must have used uh, um, phenomenal things. We didn't take that course in our civilization. We went the course of brute force with the lever and the wheel and eventually into electricity and then finally into nuclear power. And if they had a different kind of toolkit, if it was a mental toolkit, um, Dean Radin talks about a psychic toolkit. Uh, Dean Radin has been doing a lot of work on this out in California, um, trying to find the uh, scientific evidence for um, what they call psi power, PSI or PSY, um, a whole psychic uh, telekinesis there. Yeah, possibly telekinesis. Something, something like that. Now, when you talk about it today, it, to many people, it just sounds silly because we can't do that. Uh, and yet there is evidence that they did something different than us. Are those powers still latent in us? Man, I wish I had an answer. I, I just don't know. All I can do is look at the evidence and say, I don't understand it. But anything that, that, that's that um, important, I think, deserves a lot more study. Well, I have a, a, a listener question that kind of fits into this. 
he was wondering uh, about the transport of the giant stones, the blocks and all of that. What at the Belbeck, Lebanon? Yes. At Belbeck, Lebanon. And he was wondering if you had any idea or insights on in how they managed to cut, lift and transport those stones. Not a clue. And as far as I can tell, nobody else does either. Uh, one of the, the, the largest human manufactured stone is in Belbek in Lebanon. Uh, others up in Anatolia. Next year, uh, I'm leading a tour. Uh, we're going to the ancient sites in ancient Turkey. And I'm looking forward to that as well because they did things that, uh, quite frankly, without uh, our technology and sometimes even with our technology, simply defies belief. But there they are. They're, they did it somehow. We know they did it. We just don't know how. Um, I think we need to do a lot more study in this area. And I'm hoping, uh, sometimes I wish for another 30 or 40 years so I could go back and do some of that study myself rather than being toward the end of my life rather than the beginning because I think it's going to be a fascinating area of study in the years to come. But wouldn't you grant that our ancestors are very clever and uh, oh, yes. people and they found ways to do things that... Um, the building of the pyramids, I think that's been pretty well explained how it was done, not the big long ramp, but sort of a, uh, uh, a ramp around the pyramid as they dragged the stones up there. And it didn't require the number of people nor the slaves that had been claimed in the past. I think Egyptologists are now talking about a, a labor class, a kind of a middle class that did that sort of work. Uh, I mean, are we suggesting that that would have been impossible for them to do without some kind of outside influence? When I was writing about the pyramids in lost civilizations, and even earlier when I wrote about supernatural gods, um, I spent a lot of time uh, talking about that because when I was in Egypt, I was trying to get to the bottom of all this. Um, I, I, there are probably six, maybe a dozen different theories about how the pyramids were built, and each one claims to be the way. And not one of them has been proven conclusively. For instance, this idea of building the circular ramp, uh, that has all kinds of problems because dragging those stones up a circular ramp, first of all, the ramp itself would have had to be more massive than the pyramid. And there's no evidence of that ramp being taken down and, and put or used in, in any other way. Secondly, um, I don't know what kind of a, a system they would have had for dragging those stones up, but I sure wouldn't want to have been underneath one of those stones if something happened and it started to roll backwards with gravity rather than against it. And the other thing is, once you get one of those stones up to the top of the pyramid, uh, suppose you can get it up there, and suppose you can get it within a few inches of where it's supposed to go. You still have to maneuver this tone back and forth to get it so tight next to the one that's, uh, that, that's its neighbor. They have to be so tight you can't even get a piece of paper between them. And you can't get enough people around one of these stones to muscle up, to build up the manpower to maneuver this thing even six inches or three inches or even two inches. They're that heavy. So there's just no way of knowing. Um, a lot of other ideas have been put forth. Well, let me I'm let me not... interrupt here because once again I'm up against the uh, break. Okay. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to step away. I'm with Jim Willis. We're doing Lost Civilizations: The Secret Histories and Suppressed Technologies of the Ancients. I will have additional information up on my blog at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com, and I'll just cut in for just a moment here and say, if you're interested in the. Uh, um, um, Curse of Oak Island. I've got a posting that'll go up pretty quick about the last night's episode on that. If you wanted to take a look at my thoughts on that, I will be back in just a minute with Jim Willis and we'll talk maybe about Atlantis and some of those sorts of things as well. So stick around. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, Psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, 
haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, The X-Zone is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com, or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www.exxoneradiotv.com or www.exxonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember X-Zone Nation. Keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. I am back with Jim Willis. We're talking lost civilizations, the secret histories, and suppressed technologies of the ancients. And we were talking about um, the moving of those giant stones. And I guess the answer is we really don't understand how it was done today, other than the fact that they actually did it. And I've kind of, you know, I've been kind of planning out the program as we, um, as, as I prepared for this for for, for today. Um, and I wanted to move on to Atlantis. Uh, and talk a little bit about that. But there was another question that popped into my mind. Is we talk about the ancient civilizations. We're always talking about something around 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Uh, what about evidences of something much, much older than that? We're talking millions of years ago. Maybe some other kind of intelligent life on Earth or maybe intelligent visitation. Any thoughts about that? Yes, I... Um, I the same thing with with my my thoughts about ancient alien cultures or lost cultures here applies to that. I uh, I would not have pictured any kind of civilization beyond say twelve thirteen thousand years ago when the the uh, last ice age the younger Dryas collapsed on us. Um, I wouldn't have thought anything like that. But the more I began to study, the more I began to look deeper into history and discover all kinds of um, ideas about the possibilities that not only are we not the first, we're not even close to the first. We have a what they call an event horizon, an archaeological or anthropolo anthropological event horizon. We can look back uh, 24, 40, 50, even 100,000 years. Beyond that... Um, we just can't really see anything. There's been too much change in the earth. Anything that would have been built back in those times would have been really uh, destroyed by now. So we can talk about human beings being 200,000, maybe even 300,000 years old. That's a drop in the bucket when you're looking at a 5 billion year old, almost 5 billion year old planet. And I, uh, I, I find evidence in, in the strangest places. I was having a... a reading about a conversation between two climatologists who were looking at uh, ice cores from Greenland and who were looking at uh, the atmosphere that was released when those ice cores were melted and, and uh, to find out what the atmosphere of the earth was like. And one of them was saying to the other one uh, that there seems to be evidence of way, way back when, I'm talking millions of years ago now, where um, the Earth was going through changes similar to what it is going through now. And we can find that evidence in the rocks and evidence in the, in the ice and evidence um, in different kinds of evidence. So he began to wonder if thousands of years from now, scientists can look back at our time and plot what was going on, what we were doing to planet Earth. Can we do the same thing? And they discovered many of the trends back um, millions of years ago that were very similar to what we're doing now. And it caused one of them to say, it was almost as if millions of years ago there was an industrial society that was burning forests and putting all of that ash uh, up into the atmosphere and warming the earth and doing the very same thing we did. It made me begin to wonder 
Could it be possible that we are making the same mistakes in our time that other civilizations have made in the past? Again, it's just an idea. Can I prove it? Oh, absolutely not. But there seems to be some kind of evidence, and more important, people in power seem to be, or, or in, in control, seem to be asking the questions. So I'm fascinated to see where this is going to go. Well, I have, I have actually two thoughts on this. I remember when I was in grade school, and the teacher was introducing us to the concept of Greenland and said the Vikings had found Greenland. Mm -hmm. But they named it Greenland, even though it's covered in ice, because uh, they wanted people to migrate there. <laughs> but it, was, it was an ad, ad campaign, yes, but, marketing. But, but with the tr retreating of the glaciers, they're finding evidence of uh, Viking villages and Viking farms that uh, were there a thousand years ago, which suggests that the glacier... Uh, advanced over them and forced the people away from Greenland. So I always wondered about that, that maybe the teachers didn't understand what was going on there. The second thing that, that uh, you know, strikes me here is, are you familiar with the uh, Milankovitch cycles? No, that's, that's a new one to me now. The, this is um, uh, theories put out that the orbit of the Earth changes from circular to uh, um, an ellipse and back to circular. Uh -huh over a um, period of 100,000 years and that the um, uh, tilt of the axis progresses mm -hmm. from about 22 degrees to 24 degrees, which would change the climate of Earth uh, radically. Even that small percentage of change would change the axis of the Earth radically, which suggests that, that the climate changes and the things like that were not necessarily produced by any human interactions, as, as they su suggest today, but was... Uh, in, induced by the changing in the Earth orbit and the changing in the axis. That would also explain what they're finding now in, in, in Antarctica, uh, down there where there must have been ice because of where it was, uh, you know, where, where it was geographically situated, must have been ice. But And yet underneath some of that ice, they're starting to find uh, fossil evidence of uh, ferns and pine trees and things like that. How could that have possibly been at the South Pole of the United States? That would be a fat. I mean, of, of the world. That would be a fascinating, uh, fascinating thing. I'm going to have to look into that. But I, you know, that was a, something that struck me that no one ever talks about when we're talking about climate change and those problems. This Milankovitch mm -hmm. uh, cycle seems yeah. to be an answer that would explain part of it. And there's absolutely nothing we can do about that. Yeah. Because and there it's a, are it's there, a natural, there are, natural progression. Yeah, there are maps of uh, Antarctica that show sh the shoreline, which uh, the, the Piri Reis map, for instance, uh, made by the Turkish uh, admiral um, on a on a, a hide uh, that has been dated uh, way back before anybody ever knew Antarctica was there, uh, and yet he maps the shoreline. How could he do that? The shoreline would have been under ice. During, well, there's, some, uh, controversy, kind of there's some controversy about that map, and one of the problems with it, it has the Amazon Basin on it twice. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. suggests that it's a combination of other things, that he was making a, drawing a map from other maps that he hadn't actually explored the coastline exactly. of Antarctica. Yeah, exactly. He even, he even said that. Yeah, he, he said this was a copy, uh, and that's how the maps were passed down. So he was looking at something even much more ancient than the Piri, Piri Reese map. So... Once again, we're left with a great question, aren't we? How did they do it? We know they did, but how did they do it? Uh, I was, like I said, I wanted to talk a little bit about Atlantis, and we kind of moved sure. away from that. Um, I've always been a fan, well, not always, but I've been a fan of the um, Santorini explanation mm -hmm. for Atlantis. That was the Minoan culture that exploded. Yes. Uh, it was on the, on an island, and it, the volcano erupted and blew up and destroyed it basically in a day as as Plato said, and I know, understand that it's not beyond the pillars of Hercules, which is the rock mm -hmm. of Gibraltar, or the entrance to the Mediterranean. But I was, I was kind of a partial to that theory. And I noticed in your book, you weren't quite as big a fan of that as I was. Um, yeah, I had trouble. Uh, 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 Plato seemed so accurate about his dates that um, uh, although the Santorini er eruption is certainly a, a historical fact you can't get around and that's a very viable theory uh lately i've been more uh moving toward the caribbean 
um, because it, it seems to fit a little closer to the, the geographical areas, and it certainly seems to fit the time. Uh, Plato very definitely gave us a date for that, and a lot of people don't accept his date. They say that it's not, um, it can't be accurate. But he definitely gives us a date that, uh, through a long and involved process, comes to about 11,600 years ago, which was the very end of the Younger Dryas um, Ice Age. Now, the Younger Dryas Ice Age is a uh, an ice age 12,800 years ago, for those who haven't, listeners who haven't followed it, 12,800 years ago, the Earth was, or was nicely receding from the last... Um, the last glacier age, uh, and uh, everything was going along fine when something happened. And to my way of thinking right now, at least, I come down uh, on the order of a, a comet breaking up into uh, at least nine, maybe many, many more fragments that was trapped in the Earth orbit that uh, hit the Earth and put plunged the Earth back into a, 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 almost like a nuclear winter, so to speak. And there's a lot of archaeological evidence for this. And the Earth went back into another ice age that lasted until 11,600 years ago. And at that time, something happened. And again, a good guess seems to be that the the, the plug which allowed all the gla- glace, uh, uh, glacier melt to f- now flow out the uh, you know out into the Atlantic Ocean through the St. Lawrence that opened up uh, up until then it had just been flowing south toward the Mississippi into the Gulf when that opened up and poured all of that cold water into the uh, the the revolving current that is there in the Atlantic Ocean um, the Earth was very suddenly changed something quickly happened and the ice age quickly melted and all of that water um, in, a, in a, over a matter of, of perhaps even days, weeks, certainly, uh, flowed out into the Atlantic and it just changed everything completely. And a lot of the Caribbean islands, which might have been one solid landmass, uh, became the islands that we know today. So I don't know, right, right now I'm kind of hedging my bets toward uh, it, toward the Caribbean and into uh, Cuba and up into the Bahamas, but I'm certainly uh, not, I'm certainly open to Santorini because that fits a lot of very good uh, geographical things too. Well, again, we're up against a break, so I'll interrupt the conversation. I'm speaking with Jim Willis. We're talking about lost civilizations, the secret histories, and suppressed technologies of the ancients. When we come back, we'll finish up with. Um, uh, Atlantis and some discussion about that and uh, some other things like that. Once again, my blog is www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and his is, website is www.jimwillis.net for uh, additional information about this. We will be back in just a moment, so stick around. If you are looking for a safe, zero-calorie, natural option to the harmful artificial sweeteners on the market today, Just Like Sugar is what you're looking for. Just Like Sugar is a wonderful natural alternative for those health-conscious people who choose a calorie-restricted diet with a great, pure, sweet flavor that tastes just like sugar. Just Like Sugar is a great natural option for people suffering from diabetes and may be useful in restricted diet programs where standard sugars are not allowed and does not cause a laxative effect of some other sweeteners. Just Like Sugar comprises a perfect blend of chicory root fiber, natural calcium, natural vitamin C, and Just Like Sugar's sweetness comes from the natural flavors from the peel of the orange. Just Like Sugar is a natural alternative to harmful artificial sweeteners and will change the way that you believe all natural sweetener products taste. Just Like Sugar is available at your local Whole Foods markets, Wild Oats markets, Henry's, Sun Harvest, and many other fine natural food stores in the U.S., Canada, and worldwide. 
They are here, and they've been here for thousands of years, making their presence known in the shadows. They might be seen by a lonely motorist on a deserted road late at night, or by a frightened and confused husband in the bedroom he is sharing with his wife. But who are they? What do they want? Why are they here? Perhaps most concerning, has the government been aware of their presence all along? The new book by Ellie Marzulli, UFO Disclosure, The 70-Year Cover-Up Exposed, delves into the world of UFOs. Can full disclosure be soon? Order now and receive a free hour and 37-minute DVD on the UFO phenomenon, UFOs Are Real. Get both the book and the DVD, a $40 value, for only $19.99. To order your book and DVD today, go to lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I.net. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simul TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, Sci-Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Memorable dynamic presentations are a not-so-secret weapon in the business world. Do you have a powerful message that must be shared, but you haven't found a way to deliver that message? Do you want to be known as a top public speaker who gets amazing results? Are you ready to create and deliver your powerful message? Thomas Hides can help you create and deliver your speech to get the results you desire. Visit IconQuality.com. Did you expect your business to flourish, but instead it plateaued or didn't get off the ground yet? Would you like to achieve massive goals and discover new sources of income within your business? When you're ready to experience that type of success with fast results, Cindy Hendricks is the business coach for you. Her work with entrepreneurs and business owners has been life-changing. To get you and your business where you want to be, go to imaginemoresuccess.com. Has the fear of public speaking stalled your business or personal life? What would you give to develop and maintain supreme confidence? Have an invaluable private program to always perform at your best. Imagine how you would feel. You can have all that and so much more today with Thomas Hyde's life-changing course called Number One Fear Unleashed. Visit NumberOneFear.com and be liberated from your fear of public speaking. As promised, I'm here with Jim Willis. We were talking about Atlantis. He was placing it in the Atlantic. I'm uh, more of a fan of Santorini, which is in the Mediterranean. Uh, But uh, we're talking about something that took place, according to Plato, 11,000 years ago, give or take. Uh, Wouldn't we find some evidence of Atlantis on those islands unless it completely and totally sank into the ocean? One would sure think so. Um... And that's a problem. That's a big problem. I, I think Atlantis uh, officiandos, so to speak, uh, like to try to put that one under the under the carpet. But if you're going to start following facts, you've got to follow all the facts. And the truth is, there just is no archaeological evidence. There's just a lot of uh, subjective in, influence. 11,600 years ago, for instance, Gobekli Tepe, rose at precisely the time when Plato says Atlantis happened. Gobekli Tepe rose out of a hunter-gatherer culture, as if those people one day decided to grow up, to get, wake up in the morning and start moving megaton boulders and build this this uh, 
unbelievable edifice the first temple of our civilization that we know about that is some 90 times bigger than Stonehenge and all of a sudden one day even before the agricultural revolution to feed this amount of workforce all of a sudden it just arose who taught the people how to do that uh, well one possible thing might be that the survivors of the uh, Atlantis um, tragedy the survivors of whatever happened to destroy Atlantis managed to fan out across the globe and they found they landed in places like Egypt which has traditions that they call the Zeptepi the first time when they say that at the very beginning and they're talking about 10 11,000 years ago people showed up in boats they said and talked about the destroyed uh, civilization that was theirs and they were now trying to jump start that civilization again at precisely this time in history so that's one possibility uh, I'd love to say <laughs> once again how many times have we said this in the last hour I sure wish we knew but right now uh, the actual archaeological evidence for uh, a real Atlantis is, is hard to come by again we have to go to the subjective oral histories well, wouldn't um, didn't Andrew Casey talk about Atlantis re rising sometime in the late twentieth century? Yeah, that was interesting. He 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 mentioned in the Bahamas it was going to come up in the nineteen sixties, and sure enough, the very year that he pinpointed uh, was the year that the Bimini Road was discovered. Now, is the Bimini Road a man-made structure underneath the ocean? It's, it certainly seems to be man-made. Uh, right now it's covered by the ocean, but it seems, seems to lead right into the heart of uh, where Atlantis would have been. A lot of people, however, who have dived, who have you know, done some diving in that area say, no, it's just natural. Others who dive in that area say, no, it's definitely human-made. And uh, away we go. But it was the very year that Edgar Casey said it would be found. And sure enough, that was the year the Bimini Road was discovered. So that's another one where the evidence is still out and we're waiting. I, I have to throw in with the people who think it's a natural phenomenon, looking at some of the stuff I've seen about the Bimini Road and the wave actions, the way the thing could be created. So I, I throw in yeah. them with them that it's a uh, Bimini there, Road. That Edgar Casey actually failed in his prediction. Well, there there are a lot of people who would agree with you. That's for sure. Um, it's it's a it's a controversial issue. Well, let me let me just take a step back to the ancient astronauts. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking at it from the point of view. The ancient astronauts obviously were extraterrestrial beings, came from mm -hmm. outer space, which of course would be like the gods and the angels coming down. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I'm, I'm not sure exactly where you came down on that idea. Well, I'm I'm certainly open to that. Uh, there's two great theories, and depending on and every other second Tuesday or something of the month, I'm on one and then I'm on the other. Uh, certainly, I have to believe that the ancient astronaut theory is a viable theory, because uh, you know as soon as we could do it, as soon as we approach the time when we could send out uh, Voyager, for instance, as soon as we could do it, we sent out the famous golden record. We announced to the universe, here we are. And with the uh, Carl Sagan's uh, ideas about uh, the picture of human and all the sounds from Earth and all that kind of thing, as soon as we were technically capable of doing it, we reached out to the heavens and said, we're here. Are you out there? And it was deliberately intended to be found by somebody if intelligent life is out there. If we did that, I've got to believe that sentient life of any kind in this huge cosmos of which there is, there are just, there's just so much evidence that there is life out there, statistical evidence. If we did it, I've got to believe they did it. And, but uh, the other side of that coin seems to be, and anthropologically speaking, Mm -hmm. That when the cultural elements of something are available, the invention will be made. I think of Hero and the, the ancient Egypt, the Egyptian yeah. Hero, who uh, invented a steam machine, a steam yeah. engine, which they had no use for. Yeah. They, they didn't apply it because they had other ways of doing the tasks that the steam engine could do. He didn't think beyond it, but he was able to create it. I think of the Baghdad batteries, mm -hmm. which um, the cultural elements to create those existed, so they created them, but we don't understand exactly what they were used for. Maybe electroplating, I don't know for sure. But it just seems to me we're talking about the um, idea that the cultural elements existed for an invention, and, and that's kind of what you're saying there. The other side of that coin on Voyager is they don't expect it to reach another 
planetary system for 80,000 years. Yeah, yeah. So is, is it going to be able to survive the rigors of deep space? And is an intelligence beings find this thing? Are they going to be able to decipher it and figure out how to make the record play? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable, isn't it, that we are a, a, a species that is so in, unbelievably curious. And you've got to ask, what other kind of curiosity is out there in the universe, and are they looking for us? Of course, there's old, there's old Fermi and his, his, uh, his idea, if ancient aliens or aliens are out there where are they and uh, i spent a lot of time in the book answering you know trying to come up with ways to look at that question the fermi paradox so boy uh, well, for the for the listener the fermi paradox is he asked the question if there's other life in the galaxy mm. why aren't they here yet the postulation yeah. being they would be older than we are because we're orbiting a rather young star yes yeah and perhaps they are here. <laughs> Who knows? You know, uh, there's an awful lot of sightings, as you well know, more than anyone else. Uh, an awful lot of sightings, an awful lot of stories. Um, yes, but unfortunately, an awful lot of those sightings are of mundane, terrestrially based yes. objects or natural phenomena that people misidentify, including That's the problem. crying out yeah. loud the moon. Yeah. I've had UFO reports where it turned out the guy was seeing the moon. Yeah. You'd think somebody would be able to identify the moon when they saw it. Yeah, it is. It is maddening, isn't it? It 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 just drives you crazy sometimes because uh, you would like to have something solid, something real, and yet always uh, our our reach just a little bit, uh, you know, is is beyond our grasp. Um, I'm. I always hope every day I wake up. I I always hope to find some kind of news that some of these big big questions that we've been talking about. Uh, are going to be answered, uh, and it probably we won't know until a spacecraft of some kind from another dimension or another planet, uh, someplace else in the universe, or from another universe even manages to land in Central Park in New York. Probably until that happens, we're never going to have the answers we're really going to be happy with. But until then, you can't discount it. You just can't discount it. Well, I think, well, you can because you can say, where is the evidence? And the evidence is pretty esoteric. Well, yeah, yeah, there is that. Uh, I mean, it's it's conjecture. You say, well, you know, how did they move it? They must have had some kind of yeah. uh, a way of, well, obviously they had some way of doing it, but it doesn't necessarily lead us to the extraterrestrial or, or telekinesis. No, not necessarily. That, and that was, I was going to make that the other point that, a lot of these questions that we've been talking about can be answered with the ancient astronaut theory, but they that you don't necessarily need that theory uh, to talk about, for instance, lost civilizations that might have passed down their knowledge or some other ways of, that the ancients had of doing things that we just don't know anything about. Um, we don't necessarily need the ancient a uh, alien theory to supply the answers to these questions. We need something, and it might have come from the stars, it might have come from a lost civilization, we just don't know. Well, it might have come from the cleverness of the human mind. Uh, Jim Willis, make. let me thank Could you for make. taking uh, your time to talk to me about uh, lost civilizations and the secret histories of suppressed technologies of the ancients. I got that in there for you once again. Thank you. Thank the, you. Uh, the website is www.jimwillis.net. Thank you so much for your uh, time here on A Different Perspective. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate being with you. You have a good day. And as I say, I will have more information. I hope I'll have more information at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And I've done a number of books where I've kind of touched on some of these ideas and some of these theories uh, about lost civilizations and ancient astronauts and these sorts of things. And I have to say, at one point, I was kind of a big fan of ancient astronauts, but I'm kind of over that based on the way some of the evidence has been presented and the, learning something more about it um, by taking anthropology courses and archaeology courses and looking at the evidence as it, as it appears and not jumping to the speculat speculations that some of the proponents of these things do, saying, well, it must have been blah, 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 as opposed to Here, here's the evidence of what exactly happened. Uh, next week, I'm going to be joined by John Herzon of MUFON. We're going to be talking about what's going on in the world of ufology. Um, week after that, I think we'll have Charles Haldon to uh, 
give us some more insight on what's going on at Rendlesham Forest and uh, that sort of thing. And we'll be closing out the month um, in a in a few <laughs> a few weeks after that uh, with a, another good guest. Uh, I will be back in 167 hours uh, with another episode. And hey, take a look at Roswell in the 21st Century. And if the mood moves you, put a put a review up on Amazon. Thank you for joining me on a different perspective. <laughs>